Okay. On your table, uh, they brought a book table. Oh, yes, there's a book table. One of the things Francis Asbury Society does is do books. And uh, go back there. They're for sale, uh, but a few are free. We put some on the table. This is a freebie, but it just tells you who we are. And it's, this happens to be a walk through the scripture guide. Um, but this is the, some of the types of things we do and that might even hint at some of the partnership kind of things we could dream about. But uh, stop by the table. The table will probably, I think, go with the Coleman's when they leave this afternoon. So it's up today, but that's it. All right? Uh, so there was a doctor, a lawyer, a pastor, and a teenage boy on an airplane. And the plane develops engine trouble and starts to go down. There are four parachutes on the plane. The pilot grabs one and says, see you later, you'll have to figure it out. The pilot jumps out. The doctor grabs one of the parachutes and he says, I'm a doctor, I save lives, I have to live. He grabs a parachute and jumps out. The lawyer stands up and says, I'm a lawyer, and lawyers are the smartest people in the world. So he grabbed a parachute and jumped out. That left the pastor and the teenager with one parachute. The pastor very graciously said to the teenager, you take the parachute. I've lived a rich life. It's for you. Teenager said, don't worry about it. The smartest man in the world just jumped out with my backpack. <laughs> Lawyer jokes are fun, aren't they? Anyway. <laughs> Today we are talking about wisdom. And that's what the story is. I try not to tell a story that doesn't have a point. And the problem is people that think they're smart are usually the dumb ones. And that's a spiritual principle. 1 Corinthians chapter 8 says, He that thinks he knows something doesn't yet know as he ought to know. That is a marvelous verse. And we saw yesterday that the cross is God's wisdom as well as God's power. But when the world looks at the cross, it doesn't look like something smart or wise, and it certainly doesn't look like power. So the question is, how do you think in a way, how do you develop wisdom to realize that the cross is not a picture of stupidity and weakness. The cross is a picture of power and wisdom. It's like, I can't get my hands around that, much less my IQ around that. And let me tell you, you can go to school, you can get a PhD in theology and not get this right. In fact, it may be the best way not to get it right. Because this takes a certain kind of mind and the New Testament calls it the mind of Christ. And we're going to be introduced to that in chapter 2 and chapter 3 of 1 Corinthians. So why don't you turn there. Tell you what, turn to chapter, let me introduce where we are. And then I'm going to pray and read scripture. And we're going to dive in. Um, we're looking at the first four chapters of Corinthians. I know some were not here yesterday, and I apologize for not bringing above enough books. I thought I brought ten too many, but they've already been gone. But, uh, but please, it'll help if you follow along by looking over somebody's shoulder in the book. But we're looking at the first four chapters of 1 Corinthians, and I suggested yesterday that these first four chapters are about what? Who wants to answer me? And it's a little tricky question. So sometimes I ask questions. You may not want to be the first one to answer because you may be the one who realizes you're not as smart as, you're as smart as the lawyer who jumped out with the backpack. But what are the first four chapters about? Really two things. 
It's about leadership. Paul ends those chapters by saying, imitate me. It's really a marvelous passage, those four chapters about leadership, but it's also about the cross. And the question then becomes, what does the cross have to do with leadership? And you've just asked a very important question when you've asked that question. And because Paul says it has everything to do with leadership. Because the cross is all about wisdom and power. And you can't lead without wisdom and power. And if you don't understand God's wisdom and power, then you're following the leadership principles of this world. Which doesn't work in the kingdom of God. It's just the opposite. Um, let me look at a verse with you that we didn't look at yesterday. Chapter 1, verse... 11, this is the presenting problem at Corinth Community Church, CCC. Paul says, it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there is what among you? What's the word you got in your translation? Quarreling is the English, anybody else? Contention. That's a good translation. The Greek word is the word eris. I say that because in Greek mythology, if you remember your Greek mythology from, what was it, ninth grade? The Edith Hamilton book on Greek mythology. I'm getting a lot of blank looks. Anyway, I remember that book because I didn't like it. But eris was the goddess of discord. She was actually a Greek goddess. In Latin, her name was discordia, discord. But this is the word, eris, and it means quarreling, it means contention, it means strife. And Paul is saying to Corinth Community Church, there's eris among you. And it's threatening to divide the church. Because some of you say, I belong to Paul, I belong to Apollos, I belong to Cephas, I belong to Christ. Those are four interesting factions in the church. I think the Paul group was the charter generation. We're the charter members. I think the Apollos group were the educated. Those, these are the guys that have been to Bible school and seminary. The Cephas group, these are the group that keeps the law and does things right. And I think the Jesus group it's the group that says, a plague on all your houses because we're more spiritual than you. We're above that sort of bickering. And they formed their own group <laughs> because they were above the other groups. And Paul says, this strife, contention, is threatening to tear the body of Christ apart. There's only one church in Corinth. There's only one church. And it must not be divided. And so to address the problem, the presenting problem, which incidentally is not the root problem, it's a symptom of the root problem. This quarreling and strife is to the body of Christ like a fever is to your biological body. If you have a fever, you can take an aspirin and you'll feel better, but you haven't healed anything. If you've got an infection, you need antibiotics or something else to deal with the root problem. But Paul begins by saying, let's talk about the symptom. And how does he deal with the symptom? It intrigues me. It's what we saw yesterday. He preaches the cross. Now get the, get the drama here. There's division in the church. There's strife in the body of Christ. And to deal with this, the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it's the power of God. And I want to say, Paul, are you addressing the issue? What does the cross have to do with contention? And as soon as I ask the question, I say, okay, I'm going to be quiet a moment and just maybe this is going somewhere very profound. When he introduces the cross, which is what we talked about yesterday, how the cross is the crux of the matter. And the cross defines our message, 
It's what we preach. We don't preach about the cross. We preach the cross. It defines our fellowship. Paul said, look around you at who God chooses to be in his body. He chooses the losers, the lowlifes, the nobodies. Just look around or look in the mirror even better. And thirdly, the cross defines our ministry. He said, I didn't come preaching with eloquent wisdom. I didn't come trying to impress you. I was with you in weakness and trembling. The cross defines how we do ministry. Now, that's what we saw yesterday. Do you get it? Do you understand how the cross responds to the problems in the body of Christ? Much less in the world, much more in the world. If you're saying, well, I'm trying to get it, I'm trying to get my arms around it, that's exactly where you're supposed to be for our scripture today, which starts in chapter 2, verse 6, where Paul is talking about wisdom. Because to understand the cross and to realize that the cross was not just a tragic accident, it's too bad that Jesus had to die. No, the cross was in the heart of God long before it was a piece of wood on Calvary. The cross is how God operates from the beginning of time. There's a cross. The lamb is slain from the foundation of the world, the book of Revelation says. Are you getting it? Well, you need the mind of Christ to get it. It's not about IQ. It's not about another degree in theology. It's ha having the mind of Christ. So let me pray, and then we're going to read, okay? Lord Jesus, we love the cross, and I suspect there's not a one of us here this morning that doesn't know that the cross is the crux of the matter. But Lord, like the disciples, I confess how hard it is to think that way and to really get it that not just the cross on which Jesus died but the cross that Jesus said if any man would come after me let him take up his cross Lord if we're going to get this we need a brain transplant we need a new way to think and Lord we don't get there by trying harder or by developing a higher IQ we get there through the gift of your spirit and so we ask this morning that through your word and through your spirit, you would enable us to think like Jesus thinks, especially about the cross, those two crosses. So help us, Lord Jesus, for the sake of your kingdom, we pray it. Amen. Okay, let's start here, and let me just introduce it and then read the scripture. Introduction, a new way of thinking. This word of the cross, which defines our message, our fellowship, our ministry, that's what we saw yesterday, is so odd. You have to admit, it's really odd to go around talking about the cross. 2,000 years makes us used to it, but it's really weird, foolish. In fact, it is counterintuitive. That's the blank there. It's, it's the opposite. It's just the opposite of what we think. You know, one thing I've learned in following Christ at now age 61 is very often when I'm facing a decision, my first instinct, I'm learning to think that's the wrong one. <laughs> just because my mind is wrong. Very often, Jesus wants to do just the opposite of what my immediate intuition tells me because my intuition fell when Adam and Eve ate the fruit in the garden. It didn't just affect our moral behavior. It, it affected the way we think. I almost said it infected the way we think, which is not untrue either. In fact, it is counterintuitive and it goes against our natural way of thinking. The cross tells us, and we mentioned this yesterday, that folly 
is wisdom. That weakness is strength. That poverty is wealth. That sorrow is joy. That losing is winning. That down is up. That serving is leading. That death is life. And I want to scream and say, God, you got it all backwards. And God just smiles. And sometimes he winks at me and says, think about that again. Who got it backwards? Because we're living in a world like the Poseidon Adventure, like I mentioned yesterday, in a world upside down that doesn't understand power, that doesn't understand wealth, that doesn't understand joy, that doesn't understand life, and the cross rectifies things if we learn to think with the mind of Christ. This makes no sense. Does accepting the gospel mean that I must dismiss all notion of rationality and adopt a mentality that is hyper-spiritual, anti-intellectual, or mystical? And I have met far too many people in the evangelical church who respond to what I'm saying by, yeah, well, we should kiss our brains goodbye, intellectuals, or of the devil, and we should never think again, we should just be spiritual. And it's like, no, 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 no. <laughs> That's not the right response. God gave us a brain. He wants to sanctify our brain. He wants to give us a brain transplant, if I can put it that way. In this passage that I'm about to read, in fact, let's read it first, and then I'll make the comments. We're in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, Verse 6 and following. And these verses are so dense. Uh, I'm going to read them, but we could stop at almost every verse and pause, but we won't. Yet among the mature, we do impart wisdom. Now I've got to pause. What is the word mature in your translation? Anybody got a different translation? Anybody have the authorized version? <laughs> the King James, remember him? Anybody got the King James? What does the King James say? Nobody here has the King James version. Perfect. Yeah, it's perfect. And it's the Greek word teleos. And if you've been to Bible school, you'll recognize that word. That's the word that's translated perfect. Among the perfect... Among the mature, that's not a bad translation, but the word perfect sort of makes us, wow, what is he saying? We do speak wisdom. Yesterday we saw that he was speaking foolishness, which is really wisdom. And now he's saying, but it doesn't mean I'm an idiot. It means I'm talking about a wisdom that comes from God that the cross introduces us to. If we think right. And if we're perfect. Wow. Yet among the perfect, we do impart wisdom, though it's not a wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are doomed to pass away. But we impart a secret and hidden wisdom of God which God decreed before the ages for our glory. None of the rulers of this age understood this. If they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. I mean, how stupid do you have to be for God to step into your life and for you to kill him? <laughs> How stupid, how blind do you have to be for the light of the world to be standing next to you and not be able to recognize him, the light of the world? And yet every one of us are that blind and that dumb. We crucified the Lord of glory. Me, Lord? <laughs> Would I do that? That's how lost you are. That's how warped your thinking is, Stan. Verse 9. One of my favorite verses. As it is written, I has not seen, ear 
has not heard, neither has the heart of man ever imagined what God has prepared for those who have an IQ of over 150. No. God's prepared it for who? For those who love Him. Because if you love Him, you'll be drawn right into the cross and the wisdom and power of God. And you'll begin to see things and hear things and think things you've never even known existed. That's pretty incredible. This is good news. Verse 10. These things God has revealed to us through what? Going to school? Through studying hard? Through having a high IQ? Through the Spirit. This is what Pentecost is about. Pentecost opens our eyes where Peter, who said, Messiahs don't do crosses, Master. Peter stands up and starts preaching the cross. I see it. I see it. It's the power of God. What happened to Peter? Pentecost. The Spirit opened his eyes and his ears and his mouth. These things God has revealed to us through the Spirit because the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except the Spirit of that person which is in him? So also no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of this world, but the spirit that is from God, so that we might understand things freely given to us by God. I didn't figure it out because I was smart or because I was morally pure. I figured it out because the spirit of God graciously opened my eyes. Verse 13, and we impart this wisdom. This is where the preaching and the ministry comes in. We impart this wisdom in words not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit, interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. That last phrase has a lot of different a lot of ink invested in it by the commentaries. Interpreting spiritual things to spiritual people or uh, interpreting... It's in different ways, but let's keep going. Verse 14. Verse 14. He's going to introduce us now to three kinds of people. The natural person... We're going to come back to this. This is the non-Christian. The one who doesn't have the spirit, the one who doesn't have the equipment to understand spiritual things. Okay? The natural person doesn't accept the things of the spirit of God. They're foolish to him. He's not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. And if you don't have the spirit, you can't understand things of the spirit. You don't have the right equipment. It's like my old phone. If I get upset at my flip phone because I can't get on the net with my flip phone, that's not a good thing to do because it doesn't have the equipment to receive the signals that are in the room. The natural man, Paul says, doesn't have the Spirit of God. Therefore, he can't understand the cross. He'll look at you and say, that doesn't make any sense. Maybe I'll go to seminary and study. And you should respond by saying, that may be a good thing to do, but that won't help you understand the cross. There's people with the PhDs on the atonement who don't get it. Because it's the Spirit that opens your mind. Now there's a second kind of person. Verse 15. The spiritual person. This is the Christian. The one who's received the Spirit. It's the perfect person mentioned earlier. The spiritual person judges all things. 
and is himself to be judged by no one. For who has understood the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? But we have what? This beautiful expression, the mind of Christ. If I can say it this way, Paul says, we've been given a brain transplant. We think different, not because we're smart or even because we're holy, but because God has revealed through His Spirit that lives in us things that no eye ever saw, ear ever heard, nobody even imagined that something like a cross would be glorious. This is what we preach if we're spiritual. Chapter 3, verse 1. This is where it gets interesting and very personal. But I, brothers, could not address you as spiritual, but as people of flesh, infants in Christ. I fed you with milk, not solid food, because you were not ready for it. And even now, you're not ready. For you are still of the flesh. For while there is jealousy and eris, strife, quarreling, contention, while this is going on among you, are you not in the flesh behaving like a non-Christian? Though in chapter 1 he said you're sanctified. <laughs> You've been given every gift. You're enriched in spiritual wisdom and knowledge. But you behave like a worldling. Verse 4. For when one of you says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos, are you not merely human? It is so fun to read scripture. <laughs> I just, it's, it never gets old. Let me try to keep your Bibles open, but let me talk us through what we've just read and try to understand the mind of Christ because if you're going to be a spiritual leader and you don't have the mind of Christ, you are going to do more harm than good if you don't think with this brain transplant. And if the cross is not the defining reality of how you understand wisdom and power particularly. I'm in the middle of A there on still uh, page 15. In this passage, Paul explains that the gospel of the cross makes possible a new way of thinking. Because you'll never understand the cross and you'll never preach the cross unless you think different. You may talk about the cross, but you won't get it. And the people you minister to won't get it unless your mind is renewed. At first, it appears foolish and nonsensical. However, there is a secret and hidden wisdom from God that is available. But this wisdom is only for those who are, for bullets, perfect, or if you prefer to use the word mature, for those, the second bullet, who have received the Holy Spirit. You can't understand the cross if you don't have the Spirit of God in you. The third bullet, for those who are spiritual, to be a spiritual man, a spiritual woman. And the fourth bullet, that maybe sums up the others, those who possess the mind of Christ. The mind of Christ. After the chart there, Paul is intent in this passage on answering two questions. What is the wisdom from God? And how do you get the wisdom from God? Pretty important question. So that's our two points for this morning, okay? So first of all, and we've read the passage, so this should go pretty quickly. What is the wisdom from God? 
In the passage yesterday, 118 through 25, Paul had insi insisted on the foolishness of the gospel message, the cross. But this must not be taken to mean that our mind is unimportant. The gospel does indeed contain wisdom, but it is not a wisdom that is recognized by Harvard and Yale, <laughs> by this sinful world. Therefore, Paul goes to some lengths to describe the secret, hidden wisdom from God. What this wisdom is not. It is not a wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are doomed to pass away. Though containing much accurate information, human knowledge is finite and temporal. When we get to 1 Corinthians 13, which is really Paul's antidote to carnality, agape love, that's where he says knowledge is going to pass away one day. Isn't that amazing? Knowledge is going to pass away? What does that mean? But love will abide forever. He who thinks he knows something doesn't yet know as he ought to know. Humility is the posture that makes one wise. That can't be said often enough. Such wisdom is this worldly. Useful perhaps, but limited to the dimensions of time and space. Number two, it's not understood by worldlings, people of this world. In fact, none of these people could have even imagined such a gospel reality. If you like reading C.S. Lewis, one of the things C.S. Lewis says over and over about the gospel is, one of the reasons I know the gospel is true is because no human could ever make up a story like this. <laughs> and he was a doctor, or he, he was a professor at Oxford in mythology. He knew about inventing stories. He knew a lot about inventing stories. And he said, nobody invents a story like this one. It must be from God. <laughs> you have to be the blank there, a lover of God to see what no human eye and no human ear and no human imagination can understand. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. The proof that worldly people don't have this wisdom is that they crucified the Lord of glory. <coughs> and I should say we crucified the Lord of glory. I'm not excluding us from the reality of sin. I uh, just sort of had a flash moment, a uh, light bulb moment, a couple of weeks ago of worldly wisdom, an uh, example of worldly wisdom, did you read about the young man from California who joined ISIS? And the reason that I heard on the evening news he joined ISIS was because he was fed up with the immorality of the West. And so he was going to join the moral force of ISIS. And I did what you're doing. It's like, I'm not sure I get the wisdom of that. <laughs> I get the part about the immorality of the West and being fed up. Yes, amen. Go for it, young man. But to join a group that's crucifying children and beheading people and wiping out with ethnic cleansing, I mean, what kind of thinking is that? It's worldly thinking. And that's just an example that's easy to understand. <laughs> There's lots of examples of worldly thinking in the church. So B, what this wisdom is. It is secret and hidden. Interesting words. The word secret, and again, in the King James, it's a mystery. It's the word musterion. In the New Testament, a mystery is not what we think it is in English. We think a mystery is something that is impossible to understand. That's not what the word mystery means in the New Testament. Rather, it refers, a mystery refers to something that is concealed and hidden, but when it is revealed, 
and disclosed, the truth is readily understood. When Paul talks about the gospel being a mystery, he doesn't mean you can't understand it. He means you can't understand it unless the Spirit opens your eyes. But the Spirit is given. Receive Him and let Him enable you to see what others can't. Number two, it is something that God decreed before the ages for our glory. The cross was not a tragic accident. Something that God had not anticipated. <laughs> sort of as if on Good Friday God was up in heaven wringing his hands and saying, Oh my goodness, what's going on? No. From before the foundation of the world, there was a cross in God's heart. Um, I've got it here. From the beginning, God knew what would be involved in the salvation of sinners. He foresaw that the cross would be required and preordained the path that Jesus would take. Yes, the Lamb was slain from the foundation of the world. Revelation 13, 8. What an amazing statement. The Lamb slain, not just on Good Friday afternoon, but the Son of God eternally existing with the Father in the Spirit was slain, at least in prefiguring from the very foundation, because agape love is self-giving love. It's giving myself for the other, which is what the Trinity is doing all the time. Long before Genesis 1, the Trinity was doing that, giving oneself for the other. Number three. Oh, let me just, uh, John chapter 10, verse 18, in one of Jesus' arguments with the Jews, he said this, No one takes my life from me. I give my life. I have authority to give it, and I have authority to take it back. But don't you think for a moment that Pilate is taking my life or that Caiaphas is taking my life or that Judas is taking my life. I am no victim. I'm giving my life. And I can guarantee you when those Roman soldiers, when they normally nailed hands to wood, I suspect they had to rope them down and tie them to get the nail in. Can you imagine? But I picture when Jesus was there, he just said, there it is, fellas. I'm giving my life. What kind of wisdom is that? What kind of power is that? It's power to redeem a world. And that's why if you're going to be his leaders and his ministers, you've got to get this. You've got to get it. Because he showed his hands and said, as the Father sent me, that's how I'm sending you. There's no redemption without crosses. Go and do what I have done. Number three. Perhaps the most succinct way to talk about the wisdom from God is to describe it as the mind of Christ. Jesus saw things clearly and he knew that the cross was the whole point of his life. That's why when he introduced the cross and when Peter said, far be it from you, Lord, the only time Jesus ever called anyone Satan was when he said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You're not thinking with the mind of Christ, Peter. You're thinking with a human mind. You're a Satan to me. I must go to Jerusalem. I must lay down my life. And if you're going to follow me, Peter, you must do the same thing. And Peter's eyes glazed over and he says, what on earth are you talking about? That doesn't make any sense. And until Pentecost, it made no sense. But when the Spirit came, Peter said, I see. <laughs> There's two glorious crosses in this gospel. One on which the master dies and one on which I die. 
And this is how salvation comes to the world. I get it. And he's smiling when he says it. And all the unbelievers are saying, what in Sam Hill are you talking about? And Peter said, well, just keep following. Follow the leader. And he'll lead you to a place where the lights come on. And you get it. The crucifixion, uh, yeah, Jesus saw things clearly and knew that the cross was the whole point of his life. This is the way to glory. The, crucifix, the crucifixion was his exaltation. The cross was to be his throne. Remember when Jesus said several times, unless I am lifted up, unless I am lifted up, that's a coronation term. Unless I am exalted in glory, the cross is the throne from which Jesus reigns as king. And I want to scream saying, what kind of a throne is that? <laughs> Lord, you got to help me see this. You got to send your spirit to give me a brain transplant if you expect me to get that. And God winks at me and says, I can do that. <laughs> okay, Lord, help me. This was his finest hour. If I was Winston Churchill, I would have said that with a British accent. But when he was nailed to the cross, when everybody else was saying, what a tragic mistake, Jesus was saying, I was born for this hour. This is why I came. Paul explained the mind of Christ, self-giving love, more fully in Philippians 2. And uh, we're not going to turn there, but turn there sometime this week. Philippians 2 is where Paul says, Let this mind be in you. That was in Christ Jesus. Who, though he existed in the form of God, did not count equality with God something to be grasped, but he gave it all up so that he could redeem people like you. Now you think like that. Let that thought motivate you, define you, and follow him. Let him send you to do what he was sent to do. Are you getting it? It's like, Lord, I, the lights are glimmering, but I can't get this unless you help me. That is exactly right. That is exactly right. Now, Roman numeral three. How do you get this wisdom? And my main interest here is not how the book of Romans or how the book of Galatians or how the book of Ephesians talks about how to have the mind of Christ and how to be a spiritual, perfect, mature person. Those are all important. My main interest, how does 1 Corinthians talk about it? To obtain the wisdom from God, you must be, in 1 Corinthians, the right kind of person. Though, as a general rule... The Bible describes only two classes of people, the once born and the twice born. In this situation, Paul seems compelled to come up with the third reality to describe the members of Corinth Community Church. <laughs> in, in, in other words, this is what I think Paul was saying. My theology tells me there's two kinds of people. There's two doors, there's two gates, there's two directions, one to heaven and one to hell. There's only two kinds of people, the once born and the twice born. But you Corinthians, <laughs> you've messed up my theology. Because though I know, chapter 1 he says, you've received Christ, the gospel, you've put your trust in him, you live like the world. Now, this is why they're not thinking with the mind of Christ, why Corinth never understood the cross though they were Christians. And I can't think of a passage more appropriate for the American church, who's right there, in this in-between state. We believe in Jesus. We've asked him into our heart. 
But this cross stuff, especially the cross on which I'm supposed to die, I don't really get that part. Can't we just talk more about health, wealth, and happiness? Welcome to Corinth Community Church. There's three kinds of people in this passage. A, natural people. Uh, it was in chapter 2, verse 14. And if anybody's got a translation that maybe will add to our understanding as we go through this, you can uh, shout it out and help me hear it. The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God. They are folly to him. He's not able to understand them because they're spiritually discerned. The Greek word is very interesting. It's the word psychikos, psyche, P-S-Y-C-H-E. It's where you get psychology. It's the word that means soul. It's the soulish person, the person that just lives from his or her human soul. Not saved soul, not spirit-filled soul, just my animal soul, if I can put it that way. The word denotes the soul. Because they don't have the Spirit of God living within them, these soulish people are earthlings, creatures of flesh. They are controlled by their natural instincts. There's no real spiritual dimension to their existence. The spirit they have is a spirit of this world. Therefore, these people can only have a wisdom of this age. Spiritual truths are foolish to them. It's not that they're not smart. I think I said this yesterday. Uh, Malcolm Muggeridge said there are some forms of imbecility you have to be highly educated to commit. Did I say this yesterday? Uh, I love that. No, these people may have IQs and degrees. It's not they're not smart, really smart. It's just they don't have the spirit. Spiritual truths are foolishness to them. It's not they're not smart. They don't have the equipment to understand spiritual truth. They don't have the spirit. Getting advanced degrees in theology will not help. They simply cannot understand spiritual truth because it is spiritually discerned. There's a second kind of people. Spiritual people. And the word is the same word as the word Holy Spirit. I mean, it's the same root, pneuma. This seems to be a synonym for the perfect or the mature that we saw back in verse 6, which is in contrast to infants. These people have received God's Spirit, which is the reason they're able to understand spiritual things. Such a person has the mind of Christ. They get it. Without the Spirit of God, we simply cannot discern the thoughts of God because we don't have the right equipment. But spiritual people do. Okay? So there's your basic theology. You've got natural people who don't understand, spiritual people who do. Enter the Corinthians. <laughs> Enter, and Paul is sort of pulling his hair out. But you Corinthians... Are, and he almost has to invent a category to account for what's going on at Corinth Community Church. And he calls them, the blank is carnal, or if you prefer the word fleshly. Some translations translate it worldly, which I'm no scholar, but I don't think that's the right translation. It's not the word cosmos, it's the word for flesh. It's the word for our, the flesh on our bones. You are behaving like worldlings, though you're children of God. When it comes to the situation in Corinth, Paul is baffled. The Corinthians fit neither of the two categories that God has given us to understand the human condition, natural people and spiritual people. Rather, Paul has come up with a third category to deal with the situation. In the New Testament, the word flesh, which can be translated carnality, sensuality, or perhaps worldly, refers to that part of our fallen nature 
that is unredeemed and hostile to God. To be carnal, we often use it in English today, it means to be sexual. But that's not, it, it includes that. But to be carnal is just to be worldly, to be animalistic, to live as if there were no God. Just, it's me, sort of what Darwin says I am. You know, Darwin teaches us we're animals, highly evolved, but we're always surprised when we behave like animals <laughs> because we've, we're made in the image of God. And evolution can't account for that part of our reality. No, it can't. To be carnal refers to much more than sexuality. It is descriptive of those who live without the reality of God in their lives. People who spend their lives between the Red Sea and the Jordan River. In the land of in-between. I've got several sermons I preach related to the land of in-between. And if you know the map of the Old Testament, the people had enough faith to get out of Egypt, but not enough faith to get into Jordan. And what do you do when people are redeemed from Egypt, but they're not living in their inheritance? And I want to just say, welcome to Corinth Community Church. <laughs> Dare I say, welcome to the American Evangelical Church. And this is why the doctrine of holiness is so vital. And we, it's not just a doctrine we preach, it's a lifestyle we live that's going to make the doctrine connect with where the church is today. Um, four truths about carnality in Christians that I see in this passage. Real, we're, we're almost done. You're so patient. You're letting me get all worked up up here. <laughs> this is really good stuff. I can't. I thank you for the privilege of letting me just use you to work this out. This is this is good. There's four truths about carnality that we see in this passage. One, carnality is surprising. When I preached this several years ago at Loud, this was my four-point sermon. If you want a good four-point sermon. Carnality is surprising. Paul sounds shocked and perplexed about the confused situation in Corinth. You ought to be different. I know you're Christians, and yet you're behaving like worldlings. To speak of a carnal Christian is oxymoronic. You know what an oxymoron is? It's like a jumbo shrimp. That's an oxymoron. Someone said, postal service <laughs> is an oxymoron. I used this in Asbury Chapel a few weeks ago and it got a huge laugh. I said, or United Methodists. <laughs> Putting two words together that they cancel out each other. Carnal Christian is an oxymoron. One is, might as well speak of a round square. And yet, Paul says, this is what you are at Corinth. And he seems surprised. As many of you are surprised when you go to visit your supporting churches and you eat in their homes and they're talking all the Jesus stuff, they've got the Bible on their table, and yet they're living lifestyles and participating in activities, sending their children to participate in activities that you're saying... This is the world. This is the upside down world. Number two, carnality is recognizable. When it's present, you don't need a degree in theology to detect the symptoms of a carnal Christian. Paul mentions two a diet, you can recognize a carnal Christian by what they eat, and b, Behavior, by how they act. First of all, how they eat. These guys are still on the bottle. <laughs> Paul says, I gave you milk. You weren't ready for solid food. Now, it's cute if you've got a nine-month-old who's on a bottle. That's natural. It's cute. It's what's supposed to be. But if you've got a 19-year-old on the bottle, 
Houston, we have a problem. That's not cute at all. And let me tell you, the church today is full of 19, 29, 39, 69-year-old Christians who come to church saying, Pastor, can you give me my bottle? Because I haven't eaten anything since last Sunday. And I need a little pablum to get me through, maybe to Wednesday. And then I'll come back next week and get forgiven for all the stuff I did from Thursday to Saturday. That's how people think. That's carnality. You can spot it by diet. They can't handle solid food. B, behavior. Not only do they eat like babies, they act like babies. <laughs> there's jealousy. There's strife. There's contention among you, Paul says. You're going around saying, well, I'm in Paul's group. I'm in Peter's group. Paul says you're acting like the nursery department in church that forms little cliques and bully people and exclude people and scream when they don't get their way. That's how you can spot a carnal Christian. They act like babies. They're behaving like babies. Jealousy and strife indicate they are angry because they don't... I didn't get my way. you got to say it with the right tone of voice. They shout or pout. I don't know whether you're the shouting type or the pouting type. I've always been the pouting type. When I don't get my way, I pout. And Katie's called me out on that several times. She's learned my, my routines. But the point is, I don't get my way. So I act like a baby. And Paul says to the Corinthians, would you grow up? The world is dying and going to hell and God's people are behaving like a nursery. So they shout or pout. They resort to temper tantrums, name calling, bullying, and sometimes they bite. <laughs> After a church congregational meeting a few years ago, that was a nightmare. You ever been in one of those? I gathered, I sat with my associate, one of my associates at Loudonville, and he came in the door of the church the next morning, and his opening words were, sheep bite. <laughs> I said, Ron, that is so true. They're cute little fuzzy things, not always real bright, but if you're not careful, they can bite you. And especially if they're carnal. Because when they don't get their way, that's how carnal Christians respond. And Paul says, you don't see the cross, do you? And a carnal Christian will say, what does the cross have to do with getting my way? <laughs> with what we voted on at the meeting. And Paul says, everything. Three, carnality is deadly. If you prefer, you can put the word toxic. When it's in the church, it would be safer to build your church on a nuclear dump <laughs> than to be in a church full of carnality. It is poison. It's toxic. Living with sin in your life is like living with cancer. Left untreated, it will kill you. Romans 8 verse 13 Paul says, if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the flesh, you'll live. But I asked Jesus into my heart. I'm a Christian. And I think Paul just repeats it. But if you live with this toxicity, it will kill you. Corinthians, you can't stay there. Carnality is deadly. It will eventually kill you. Jesus came to save us from our sins, not to leave us in them. How many times can we say that? Carnal attitudes and behaviors are destroying the church at Corinth. The problems will not be solved by seminars on behavior modification, teachings about conflict resolution. And I'm not opposed to those things, but let's get real. You can go to those seminars till the cows come home and still be a baby carnal Christian who shouts and pouts. And you and I both know it. A deeper work of grace is needed. To be carnally minded is death. Four, 
Carnality, here's the good news, is curable. <laughs> Anybody want to say amen to that? That's a good place to say amen. It's curable. That's why Paul is addressing it. But how do we stop eating and behaving like babies? How do we give up our childish ways? And that's a quote from 1 Corinthians 13, which is the love chapter. Because agape love is the answer to carnality, at least in Corinthians. This is how Paul deals with carnality in Corinthians. He says, though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, I can have every gift in the charismatic book. But if I don't have agape love, it amounts to nothing. When I was a child, I talked and spoke and reasoned like a child. But when I grew up, I put, on, put away childish things. In the Bible, to be childlike is good. To be childish is terrible. <laughs> Don't confuse the two. Shall we end? Three things to grow up. You've been so patient with me. And uh, this is not a final, I don't like formulas. This is not a formula. I don't think the Bible gives us formulas. Uh, Americans love formulas and recipes. Uh, but this, are, this at least points us in the right direction. Three things we need to do to grow up, to put away the carnal nature. A, recognize the real problem. The problem is worse than you think. The Corinthians thought their problem was strife and contention and factions in the church. Paul said, that's just a symptom. <laughs> that's just a symptom. The problem is carnality. And it's worse than you think. It takes more than behavior modification and trying harder to deal with the inner cancer that is causing strife and conflict in my life. I am so tired of going to churches and when the sermon, all I hear is, when I'm walking out the door, what sticks with me is, I got to try harder. I got to try harder. I got to try. I know that. <laughs> I know that before I, church started. Don't just beat me up. Give me hope that the Spirit can do something in my heart that trying harder doesn't fix. Beware the heresy, and I choose my words, that teaches justification is by faith, but sanctification is by trying harder. And let me tell you, that is preached. Now, the preacher would deny it, because usually he's been to school and he knows, that's no, that's, I don't believe in sanctification by works, but that's what we hear on the pew. i got to try harder. If I go from 15 minutes a day in daily devotions to 30 minutes a day in daily devotions, then I'll live in victory. Okay, Lord, I'm going to try. Now, you may need to go to 30 minutes. You may need to go to an hour a day. I don't know what, that's a different question. But that's not going to deal with carnality. In fact, it may increase carnality. And you may produce a church full of Pharisees, which is frankly worse than a church full of prostitutes. <laughs> Give me the latter rather than the formal. You guys are really getting me worked up. I don't... Uh... Beware the simplistic idea that the passage of time will accomplish spiritual growth. I just want to go on record saying growth is overrated in the church. Growth is important. But there are some things you never grow out of like carnality. Just because I've been a Christian for 10 years doesn't mean, well, now I'm mature. Not necessarily. It takes God's grace to deal with carnality. That's a whole nother step. And when we don't preach that, when we create the impression, well, you just need to grow more, we're just saying, try harder, try harder, try harder. Try not to act like a baby. It's <laughs> like, but I am a baby. <laughs> B, recognize the real solution. Uh, yesterday, 
or two days ago when Katie and I were driving up, we were listening to a tape of C.S. Lewis, uh, Mere Christianity. It was a recording of Mere Christianity. But in one of his, it's, it is incredibly good. One of his statements is, he says, when I was little and I had a toothache, I didn't want to tell my mother I had a toothache. I really wanted aspirin to feel better, and I knew if I told her I had a toothache, she would give me aspirin, but I didn't want to tell her because I knew my mother. If I told her I had a toothache, she'd give me an aspirin, and then tomorrow morning she would take me to the dentist who would drill and do things and find things in my mouth that hurt like fury. So I didn't, though I wanted the toothache dealt with, I didn't want healthy teeth. And he says, that's what sin does. When you go to Jesus and say, can you help me with my toothache? Jesus is going to take you to the doctor. He's not just going to give you an aspirin. <laughs> and he says, Jesus took me to the cleaners when I went to him for sin because he took me in for the whole cure. I don't know if you remember it. He says, when Jesus said, be perfect, he wasn't talking idealistic gas. <laughs> That's how he says it in his inimitable British way. He meant it. He's taking you to the doctor for the whole cure. And yes, it'll hurt like fury because crosses always hurt. But that's where redemption lies. The real solution is we need a brain transplant. We need the mind of Christ so that we can think differently when we present our bodies as living sacrifices in an act of total consecration then we begin to experience the transformation that comes as our minds are renewed. Romans 12. This is crisis and process. Let this mind be in you. And finally, and with this we're done, you'll be pleased to know. Receive and believe. And just Look at this wonderful blank from Philippians 2. This is right after the let this mind be in you passage where Paul says, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence. Anybody know what he says? Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in <laughs> you to will and to work for your good pleasure. I got that from Oswald Chambers, who says, we've got to work out what God has worked in. It's just so good. They're both involved. God's got to work it in. We've got to work it out. I don't know how to say it better than that. I thought of this silly story this morning, but it, uh, it helps me. Maybe you've heard the story of, in the old church, country church, where at Wednesday night prayer meeting, one of the old geezers in the church used to pray every time with passion, Oh, Lord, clean out the cobwebs of our lives. Oh, Lord, clean out the cobwebs of our lives. And week after week after week, he would pray the same thing. And finally, people were getting tired of this prayer. And one of the other members of the church, when he started saying, Lord, clean out the cobwebs, the other brother said, Lord, kill the spider. <laughs> There's good theology there. A lot of people think Jesus died to clean out the cobwebs. Yeah, he did that. That's good. And that's not a bad place to start. Cobwebs are symptoms of something bad. But the cross says he wants to kill the spider. Father, we thank you for an incredible gospel the word of the cross to those who are perishing is foolishness. But to those who are being saved, it's the power 
of God. And Lord, if we're going to be agents of redemption, co-laborers with you in the work of the evangelization of the world, we've got to do more than preach the cross. Lord, we've got to live it. So Lord, would you send your spirit and do what we can't do. There are some things we can, but you've got to work in us so that we can work it out. And we ask you to give us as that gift that it is, the mind of Christ, the presence, the reality of your spirit that enables us to see what no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, what no heart has even imagined, the things that you have prepared for those who love you. For the sake of the kingdom, we pray together. Amen.